Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on Galatians. It's actually entitled The Gospel in Galatians. And this particular lesson is lesson number two in that series for July 8th of 2017. It's entitled Paul's Authority and Gospel. And this is going, to be, it's going to introduce us to some of the real challenges in the book of Galatians. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you recognizing your presence and recognizing what a challenge it was for Paul to write this brief letter so many years ago. Obviously, he was very stirred. He felt a real burden for what he had to say and help us to get that fire in our hearts and that burden that we have for soul that that he had for souls in our day as well as our prayer in Jesus name amen well in our last lesson we discussed the historical background of Paul himself we discussed his conversion on the road to Damascus and what happened to Paul later so now let's talk a little bit about Galatia. What do we know about Galatia? Who were the people of Galatia? Where was it located? Well, Galatia was in northwestern uh, Asia Minor. Today that would be Turkey. They, it was called Galatia because a group, some two, three hundred years before that, a big group of people had migrated down from Gaul, from what would be France in our day, uh, down across Macedonia and into Asia Minor and set up their homes there. Did they probably migrate because of ice, ice age? There's, there, there are some people who think that, but that's, a, that's a, a strange time for an ice age, but it's possible. Or maybe wars, who knows what, uh, why it could have happened. Um, so, do we have any idea what kind of experience Paul had with the churches in Galatia? Ups and downs. Ups and downs. And the truth is, we don't know much. We know that those couple of cities in, way in the southern tip of Galatia, Paul had talked about on his first missionary journey. He went back there briefly on his second missionary journey. But then he was in Ephesus for three years and... That was not far from Galatia, so he would have had opportunity, on no doubt, to go out to other places around in that territory and, and speak to people there. So he probably had, had some experience working with the Galatians. Well, the books of Galatians and Romans are very similar in many respects. Acts of the Apostles 383.1 and the SDA Bible Commentary on Galatia, Galatians Quote, Ellen White is suggesting that the book of, of Galatians was written at the same time as Romans was, which not everybody agrees with, as you will discover if you read our Bible study guide. Um, but but if, if that's true, as she suggests, and as I believe, the, these two books would have been written in the winter of A.D. 57-58, while Paul is tarrying in Corinth. These are her words. While tearing at Corinth, Paul had cause for serious apprehension concerning some of the churches already established. Through the influence of false teachers who had risen among the believers in Jerusalem, division, heresy, and sensualism were rapidly gaining ground among the believers in Galatia. Okay, division, heresy, and sensualism. Would you like to guess what that involves? Additions. <laughs> well, clearly these people were Judaizers. We we learn that basically a little bit later, meaning that they again wanted to teach the people in these churches that you had to go through all the Jewish ceremonies. But there were a lot more to that because it turns out that these Judaizers did a lot of other things, sort of weren't weren't authorized. Let's say. These false teachers were mingling, Jew, mingling Jewish traditions with the truths of the gospel, ignoring the decision of the general council at Jerusalem. Who was there at the general council of Jerusalem? Peter. Paul, right? And Peter. 
They urged upon the Gentile converts the observance of the ceremonial law. The situation was critical. The evils that had been introduced threatened speedily to destroy the Galatian churches. Paul was cut to the heart and his soul was stirred by this open apostasy on the part of those to whom he had faithfully taught the principles of the gospel. He immediately wrote to the deluded believers exposing the false theories that they had accepted and with great severity rebuking those who were departing from the faith. After saluting the Galatians in the words, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, he addressed, addressed them in these words of sharp reproof. And that's the part we're going to talk about. So, how did Paul end up in Corinth? Just briefly. He had worked there a year and a half, hadn't he? In the past, at the end of his second missionary journey. He had gone back, and on the way going back, he had passed through Ephesus. He was traveling with um, Aquila and Priscilla, and the people at Ephesus begged him to stay, and, 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 and there obviously were some Christians there. Ephesus was another city that was qu quite large, rivaling Antioch in Syria, um, and it had that famous temple of Diana or, or uh, Artemis. Artemis there, depending on whether you're speaking Latin, thinking Latin or Greek. Um, and so they were so anxious to have someone stay and work with them that Aquila and Priscilla stayed there in Ephesus, continuing to work, and Paul promised that he would do what? That he would come back. And Paul came back, he stayed in, in Ephesus for three years, and during that time, what did he hear about what was going on in the church in Corinth? All sorts of crazy things. We don't have time to review that right now, but as a result of that, he wrote um, apparently a short letter, which we don't have, unless we may have a little piece of it, and then it, it didn't seem to make much difference, so he wrote the, what we call 1 Corinthians, and that still didn't seem to impact the people in Corinth, so he wrote them a very strong letter, which is probably, we have at least part of it, in, in 2 Corinthians 10 to 13, and then that was, that was after he had made a visit to Corinth. He probably traveled by boat. It's only a few days across there if you're traveling by boat from Ephesus to Corinth. And they had rebuffed him and treated him nasty and so forth. These are the Christians. He went back to Ephesus and wrote that very strong letter. And then he sent Timothy and said, hey, you know, go find out what's happening over there. And they said, please come back. You know, we, we're ready to accept you this time. And so Paul traveled over there again and actually spent the winter in Corinth. And it was during that time that he wrote Galatians and uh, Romans. How do, you, how do you think that Romans are is similar in, to Galatians? Oh, well, that's a... That's a is it just, just the, the writing style? The writing style and the material. There's a lot of overlap between the material between those two. It seems like Romans, um, well, yeah. I mean, it, be, both of them deal with the question of what is the gospel? That's probably the most mm -hmm. important single theme of both of those. Okay, as apostle to the Gentiles, Paul believed it was his mission to move from one major Gentile city to another, starting churches which he hoped in turn would spread the gospel to surrounding areas. That was his idea. This meant that he could never spend too much time in any one place. He wrote a number of letters back to churches who, 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 who he had founded earlier. Thirteen of those letters form almost half of the New Testament. He encouraged churches to share their letters with other churches. By the way, um, do we have any evidence that Paul wrote any letters that we don't have? Yes. Where? Laodicea. I think there's okay. a mention. Well, there's in some. One of the, in one of his letters, he mentions also read the, the letter I sent to Laodicea. somewhere else, Laodicea, and they, you know, share each other's letters, basically. Okay. Uh, some people would suggest that the letter to the Laodiceans was actually the letter of Philemon. But what about this? Look at 1 Corinthians just quickly. 1 Corinthians 7. Um, I think this is the place. Oh, 
hold on here, I think. Talks Oops. about the letter that he had previously sent yeah. them. Yeah, and I'm not finding the spot right now. I'm going through this too fast. So there are other letters that Paul wrote. But anyway, it's, it's very letters. clear. He talks about the letter, letter he had. This is in First Corinthians. He talked about the letter he had previously written to them. And so obviously there's at least one letter there that we don't have. Okay, so letters such as Galatians played an essential role in Paul's apostolic ministry. And they're very important to us for what reason? If Paul had not been writing letters, we would be missing half our New Testament, right? Almost. Mm -hmm. Well, although he visited ch these churches whenever he could, he couldn't stay in one place too long. To compensate for his absence, Paul wrote letters to the churches in order to give them guidance and so forth. Um, as, it, as the above words from Peter show, too, at some point, Paul's writings were viewed as scripture. This shows, and I, sh I should guess I should read that to you. Um, where do we get the information from Peter that Second, Paul's... Second Peter 3, 15 and 16, I think, yeah. wasn't it? As soon as I can get there. Come on. Let's try again. Look at our, this is Peter writing. Look at our Lord's patience as the opportunity he is giving you to be saved, just as our dear brother Paul wrote to you, using the wisdom that God gave him. This is what he says in all his letters when he writes on the subject. There are some difficult things in his letters which ignorant and unstable people explain falsely, as they do with other passages of the scriptures. So they bring on their own destruction. So what's Peter saying? And he's suggesting that Paul's writings were equal to scriptures from the Old Testament, huh? Now, a lot of people have a big, a lot of so-called so scholars have a big problem with that. I don't find there any problem with that at all, but they do. There are a lot of scholars that have problem with Second Peter period. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, it says that they twist the two texts yeah. mm -hmm. together. I don't know if you could come up with the conclusion that they thought they were the same as equivalent as mm -hmm. far as scripture goes, but mm -hmm. I think it is now, but <laughs> yeah. back then, I wonder. Well, he's basically saying that what Paul s said is en essentially truth, and they just twist it, just yeah. as they do the rest of scripture, which is also the truth about God. They also twist some of Peter's writings. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> major well, there's an interesting bit of historical information that might be useful in your understanding something of these letters. At one time, some Christians believed that the format of Paul's letters was unique, a special format created by the Spirit in order to contain God's inspired word. This view changed in 1896 when two young scholars from Oxford, Bernard Grenfell and Arthur Hunt, discovered in Egypt about 500,000 fragments of ancient papyri. I think all those have been, re have been read? Probably by now, maybe. Documents written on, pa on papyrus, a popular writing material used several hundred years before and after Christ. In addition to finding some of the oldest copies of the New Testament, they found invoices, tax receipts, uh, tax returns, receipts, and personal letters. Much to everyone's surprise, the basic format of Paul's letters turned out to be common in all letters, letter writers of his, in his day. The format included one, an opening salutation that mentioned the sender and the recipient, and then included a greeting, two, a word of thanksgiving, three, the main body of the letter, and finally four, a closing remark in short. Paul was following the basic format of his time, speaking to, all his, to his contemporaries through a medium and style with which they would be familiar, and that's from our Bible study guide for Sunday. Well, so how did these churches, do you think, receive these letters from 
Peter and Paul and so forth. Did they do you have any hint that they were just jumped on them and they thought this is pure gospel and everybody was very happy about them? What happened in Corinth? Well, he seemed to encounter some resistance there. Definitely. <laughs> it's a very strong resistance, at least for a while. You know. But we've already read Peter's feels feelings about Paul. Um, well, what do you think? Did in those days, do you think someone who had been a disciple, a direct follower of Jesus, would be regarded as having more authority than, let's say, a deacon or maybe Paul who didn't have direct contact with Jesus? Some certainly might have thought that. Yeah. But where does that lead us? Yeah, exactly. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 3, doesn't he? Some want to follow this one, some want to follow that one, some want to follow Jesus Christ, and so forth. It seems that the false teachers had already begun their work. Mm -hmm. The ones that Jesus had predicted would come on the scene. Yeah. Well, what do you think? Let's just take an example. What do you think about the sermon of Stephen? Would you say that was inferior in any way? Since he wasn't a disciple, it has to be inferior, some would say. <laughs> I don't think so. I do not think so. By the way, you think that Stephen followed the format that uh, Jesus used in the road to Emmaus? I think so. Except that he had more words to say at the end, but he thought things were getting a little riled up among his audience, so he sort of skipped <laughs> quickly to the end um, when he got near the end of the chapter. Well, was Paul an apostle? What's an apostle? Someone sent. Sent out to do a specific job, yeah. Um, couldn't God have arranged for Saul to meet Jesus at some point during his education in Jerusalem? Would that have given Paul greater authority? Not necessarily. Jesus did meet, meet uh, Paul on the way to, on his way. And Paul's going to make a big point out of that, isn't he? Sure is. Yeah. On the Damascus Road? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and, and later as well, in, in the book of Galatians. Mm -hmm. Well, we face that question even today. In your mind, you think about it out there. In your mind, which has greater authority? Something that's proven by scientific evidence or something that's revealed in the scriptures? For example, on health. Well, first of all, science, uh, science teachers will tell you that science proves nothing. You mm -hmm. can disprove something and you can give evidence for something, but it never quite proves it. There's always the thought that it could a be slight possibility. something could disprove it. it there's a, just a slight. We can tell by the laws of chance that there's at least a small possibility that those results could have happened just by chance in every scientific experiment. Or there could be another piece of information that yeah, comes the, along that, that we don't have. That just proves it. Yeah. yeah. And there's relativity in science. Yeah. Well, what about prophets who never wrote any books? Are they less authoritative? Can you remember the story of Huldah? A lady, prophet, in the Old Testament, as Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. And the king said, what's going to happen? We need to, we need to consult somebody who has some authority. He sent a group of people to Huldah. So he thought they had authority, she had authority. Well, the big argument, of course, in these, brought up by these Judaizers was, you have to follow all the Jewish practices if you really want to be a Christian. How would you respond to that kind of an argument? Paul tried, didn't he, in numerous cases, numerous occasions. And Peter brought up things when he was defending himself in regard to the Cornelius thing, and mm -hmm. to the extent that, you know, things that we couldn't even keep up with, you know, mm -hmm. uh, those sorts of things. I, I don't remember exactly how it went, but 
Well, plus you sort of cast a negative light on some of the huge amount of rituals and things that yep. they were having to keep up with. When, when would you be converted? I mean, if you heard the gospel, mm -hmm. now I've got to go to school for three years, mm -hmm. and then finally I'm converted. Yeah. So that, that's kind of well, difficult. I used, to, I used to live in another part of the world. Worked there for many years. And in some places where I used to live, you had to take baptismal classes for two full years before you could be baptized because they didn't want people just rushing into the church. They were afraid that people who'd come out of paganism and so forth wouldn't really be fully grounded unless they'd had two years of baptismal classes. And where well, did they come up with two years? That's how long it took to go through the Bible book by book? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah. I wish. As, as, as these people were reading the Bible for themselves? I wish that too. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I don't know if I should say. Anyway, some of those places I, I've asked people, they're students, people who were, who were leaders in the church, and I asked them, uh, how many books, how many of the books in the Bible have you read through, all the way through, a single book? None. They had never read through, these are, these are supposedly leaders. Never read through all the way, like one of the Gospels, for example, from beginning to end, no. Nope. Just reading something to try to really learn something, not part of their culture. How many in our church have done that? Oh, uh, I didn't ask that, did I? I don't think you better ask that. <laughs> well, when people are converted, what, what shows them that they're converted? Well, it's supposed to be a change in their heart. Okay. It's supposed to be acceptance of guidance, acceptance of the Holy Spirit is leading them in their future activities. But that that's as time goes on, but, but when they're converted the and say, I want to be baptized, well, what's, is it just the fact they want to be baptized? Well, that hopefully, tells them all? hopefully someone's checking to see if they have an idea what it is they're being baptized into. Well, when they, when they take the reports back to the Jerusalem, mm -hmm. what, what do they tell them that these people are converted? Okay, and that's a good question, and they, we have a wonderful example in Acts um, 10, 11, mm -hmm. because Peter knew what kind of problems he was going to have when he got back to Jerusalem. So what did he do? He took seven witnesses with him <laughs> from <laughs> Joppa to Cornelius's place so that there would be, the, no. the Jews believed that if you had seven witnesses, this is proven beyond the possibility of being wrong. So Peter said, I'm not taking any chances. He took seven witnesses. And so when he got to Jerusalem with his seven witnesses, they started accusing him of all kinds of things. He said, well, this is what happened. And God did this and this. And here's all my witnesses to prove it. And in light of that, the general brethren in Jerusalem had to say, okay, it looks like God, God has accepted Gentiles to become Christians. So there was, there was something that was happening that they could describe that, that would say, yes, we've seen well, this when we were converted. In their case, it was, it was the Holy Spirit came down upon them somehow, whether they were speaking in tongues or what they were doing. That's th their description was that the Holy Spirit came down upon them as he did for us at Pentecost. And then they were baptized mm -hmm. right after that. As far as quick baptism, how about the Philippian jailer and his family? Mm -hmm. and, the and the earthquake Ethiopian, and... Ethiopian yeah. eunuch also. Yeah. Him too. Yeah. Well, um, I would be a little more comfortable with the Ethiopian eunuch because he had already adopted Judaism. He must have had, and here he is reading a scroll of Isaiah, so he had some background. But the Philippian jailer, he was no, I'm sure he was a Roman citizen. And what exposure he had to Christianity, not only him, his whole family. Yeah. And baptized that night. Yeah. But they had less to unlearn, in a way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, boy. Well, these Judaizers, 
they came along and they knew exactly what Paul was teaching. And they were determined to undo what he had taught. Um, and I'm not going to read these verses. Uh, let me just read this, this comment. This is from Acts of the Apostles, page 386. The men who had attempted to lead them from their belief in the gospel were hypocrites, unholy in heart and corrupt in life. Their religion was made up of a round of ceremonies through the performance of which they expected to gain the favor of God. They had no desire for a gospel that called for obedience to the, world, to the word. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3. They felt that a religion based on such a doctrine required too great a sacrifice, and they clung to their errors, deceiving themselves and others. Now, we sometimes think that these people want to do everything. They want to, you know, she says they, they didn't want to do any of the important things. So how did Paul respond to these critics? These false teachers? Mm-hmm. Well, when I read Galatians, he, Paul seems to be a little bit upset with the Galatians just as much as but, them because yeah. it seems like they believed the last person who talked to them. Yeah. And he spent a lot of time in the, in his, the writings here yeah. trying to show the quality of him as a messenger as opposed to the other people. So what, what does that teach us? It, it says that these people are not only arguing about the gospel, they're arguing about Paul's authority to even teach the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, let me read this first. Yes, right. Yeah, there, there's a reason for that. Uh, mm -hmm. The Galatians were very legalistic mm -hmm. in their own way, and so were the Jews for that mm -hmm. matter. And Paul had a message that was pulling them away from those laws. Uh, religion is not a matter of legalism. Mm -hmm. Religion is a matter of the heart. Mm -hmm. And that is a very difficult switch to make because we'd like our religion to, let, to tell us what to do, just like the children of Israel in the desert where they wanted God to tell us what to do. No, that's not what I want. What I want is a changed heart yeah. is what God would say. Yeah. And that is an incredibly difficult lesson for humans to absorb. Yeah. They want the form of godliness, but they do. not the power of it. Yeah. And they want to be able to say, we did this and this and this and this and this, and therefore God has to save us. Yeah. Well, here's what, here's what Paul says in beginning his letters, that's, since that's what we're supposed to be doing in our lesson today. From Paul, whose call to be an apostle did not come from human beings or by human means, but from Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from death. Bang! I mean, not, he's, not, he's not wasting any time, is he? All the brothers and sisters who are here join me in sending greetings to the churches of Galatia. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. In order to set us free from this present evil age, Christ gave himself for our sins in obedience to the will of God of our God and Father. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So, he, he, he can't even wait to finish up his greetings without saying, you know, I have the authority to speak, and you better listen to what I have to say. Well, he followed the, the format, the general format of an ancient letter. Um, he said that his gospel did not come from human beings, it came directly from God. Having made that statement, he went on to address the people of Galatia. He followed with a brief doxology, praising God, and then did something quite out of the ordinary. Instead of praising the Galatians, as he did all the other congregations to which he wrote, he talks to the, he talk, he talked those people he, he he called those people in Corinth saints, with all the problems that they had. Remember, instead here in Galatia he immediately launched to an ac, into an accusation, and this accusation is almost unreadable. Look at this, I am surprised at you, and no time at all you are deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are accepting another gospel. Actually, there is no other gospel. But I say this because there are some people who are upsetting you and trying to change the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven 
should preach to you a gospel that is different from the one we preach to you, may he be condemned to hell. We've said it before and now I say it again. If anyone preaches to you a gospel that is different from the one you accepted, may he be condemned to hell. Was Paul uh, sure about his gospel? <laughs> he could have said he will be condemned to hell. And it no, would still he, be the same thing. Yeah. Does someone being sure about something make it right, though? Well, Paul had been sure about his Phariseeism. Yeah. And that was wrong. And there are many in our day and age who are very sure of some things that are totally wrong, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, a, a very obvious, obvious point is Protestants in general, well, I shouldn't say that, Adventists, let's just say Adventists at least, believe that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is resting in her tomb or her grave somewhere. Catholics very strongly believe that she's in heaven standing next to Jesus. We can't both be right. Well, so it, it looks pretty obvious that the issues that Paul was talking about were very fundamental and very important issues. What is the truth of the gospel? Is this still an issue today? Could you spell out in a few words your definition of the gospel? Well, notice these words of Paul in Romans, written about the same time. Romans 14, verses 1 to 5. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but do not argue with them about their personal opinions. Some people's faith allows them to eat anything. And remember in Romans 14, as, as in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, the argument is about whether or not it's all right to eat meat offer, that has been offered to idols. That's the argument. So, but the person who's weak in the faith eats only vegetables. So if you don't think you dare to eat that meat because it's been offered to idols, you better eat only vegetables. This has nothing to do with the health message, by the way. Those who will eat anything are not to despise those who don't. So you're not supposed to say, well, I'm strong in the faith and therefore I can eat this stuff. You, okay, fine. But you have no right to criticize the people who refrain from eating that stuff. While those who eat only vegetables are not to pass judgment on those who eat anything. Oh, you sinners, you eat all this other stuff, right? For God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servants? It is their own master who will decide whether they succeed or fail. And they will succeed because the Lord is able to make them succeed. Some people think that a certain day is more important than other days. Do we think a certain day is more important than other days? Mm -hmm. <laughs> While others think that all days are the same. We should each firmly make up our own minds. Wow. Do we have that much freedom? Well, Paul, Don't ever, yeah? Yeah, when he says that uh, let everyone be fully convinced in his own mind, he's not giving people carte blanche to believe anything they want as long as they're firmly convinced. Because uh, in other places, he's very obviously here in Galatians is one example of that, that there is very much something that is not disputable. Mm -hmm. These are just things over which people have different opinions. And we are to be gracious to, to one another. They'll stand before uh, Christ uh, individually, not, it's not isn't, up isn't to us. Isn't everything kind of an opinion? What? Everything you believe, kind of an opinion? Well, that's the There's question some here. some things that we put together through evidence, but the way we put it together, did we do it right? Yeah. How much coercion or extortion or do you have to, this has to be used to convince a person? I mean, if it's, it has to be okay, done well, that here's, way, it's not... Here, here's Paul in writing at the same time to two different churches. One place he says, we each should firmly make up our own minds. Another place he says, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different from the one we preached to you, may he be condemned to hell. Now, are those two statements compatible? On the surface, it doesn't seem like it. Well, <laughs> yeah. again, he's, he's talking about two different kinds of things, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, whether, like with, if we're going to eat healthy food, there are p 
people who have different opinions about what indeed is healthy, but uh, we still don't. We still have this idea that this is food, and that pile of manure over there is not food. You mm -hmm. know, so there's there's uh, certain things that are just obvious and plain. And to him, the gospel is is undisputable. It's uh, something that's m much more important than these other things that uh, people sometimes make out to be important. Very good. But I still think even with this here, um, you should be able to to be convinced of it yourself. Yeah. Um, you can't just take what he said and say, oh, I believe that. You can think about it for a while and, and come up with reasons well, why, he's, why he's coming this way. Mm -hmm. And then these other teachers come uh, and then they're so easily swayed by the other teachers. Yeah. So if if they really understood what he was saying, they wouldn't be so easily swayed. That's why he's coming Hopefully back, not. and we're going to send the rest of the letter going over what his arguments were for yeah. these things and why they were so important. Do, do are we so clear on the gospel and so con convinced about it that we cannot be moved? That's called the ceiling, isn't it? Yeah. Well, was Paul overstepping his bounds? Is it possible to be that sure about the gospel? Sure. Well, he was. Yeah. Do we know what the core issues were that Paul was so concerned about? It would make con matters considerably clear if we had a careful ex explanation written out about what the Judaizers were teaching, but we don't have that. We only have Paul's response to them. Yeah, but that's all we need because yeah. Judaizers were all focused on the law mm -hmm. and religion was a matter of following laws. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the Galatians were pretty much that way as well. Paul is trying to bring a different message. No, it's the law is not what makes you what you are. It's what you are in your heart that makes you what you are. So it's a totally different concept yeah. from what the world in general had been accepting as a form of religion mm -hmm. as opposed to the power thereof. Yeah. Well, he, as we'll see later as we study Galatians further along, in Galatians 5.12 he gives us a hint about one of the issues. He says, I wish that the people who are upsetting you would go all the way, let them go on and castrate themselves. This is getting pretty graphic. The point is <laughs> so what is he saying? He says, you people who want to go around circumcising everybody. Go further. <laughs> you do the rest of it. Yeah, right. Let's slip. <laughs> well, the Judaizers believed that they had this thing all worked out, and they knew what, the, 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 what was required for salvation. Paul vehemently disagreed. This led to two additional questions arising. Who has the authority to say what the gospel really is? and what is required for salvation. And those are the, going to be the two big questions that we're going to deal with in this whole series of lessons. Well, so should Paul have raced back to Jerusalem every few minutes and said, uh, is it all right if I say this? Is it all right if I say this? Is this the gospel? This is not the gospel? Of course not. Truth is truth. These are the people who tried to force him to change his opinion a little bit and end up in, in getting him imp imprisoned at the end of his, or near, closer to the end of his life. And I, I just, I, I'm, I try to imagine in my own mind how those fishermen from Galilee felt around the former Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin. I mean, suppose one of our country churches with, you know, relatively less education. All of a sudden, somebody moves in who was the dean of the seminary or, or was a member of Congress or something like that. I mean, you know, how would you feel about that? Well, it's, one, it's very clear that Paul was not into spending a lot of time just seeking human approval, right? Well, he did briefly there in Galatians 2, 2 where he says he came <laughs> up and he submitted it to the, uh, the apostles. but. They accepted it. They didn't even require Titus to be circumcised. So mm -hmm. uh, there was a s sense of him submitting this, but uh, 
he was still certain of it, I think. Yeah. What about us to do today? What authorities, what authorities do we really recognize today? Do we even recognize what authorities are influencing our thinking? Or do we simply float along with the crowd? What do you, what do you mean by authority? Well, I Is mean, it, it's from, from some place, you're getting ideas and you're adopting them into your belief system. Where are those, pla where are those sources of authority coming from? Now, of course, we would say Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we would say, oh, it must be the Bible, it must be maybe the writings of Ellen White. But is that what we really are accepting? Well, we, we should be seeking the Word of God mm -hmm. in whatever manner well, it comes to us, whether, of course, through scriptures or, or through his prophets uh, in other settings. Why is it that we observe, especially the young people, many of them in our church, they want to follow the latest trend. They want to, I mean, even here in Loma Linda where there's lots of churches, if some charismatic preacher comes in one of these churches, all the young people, and then when that person moves and somebody else comes, um, That's the characteristic of, a, of youth. I mean, you look at our colleges. Yeah. That's where all the discussion and, well, you know. Do we carefully evaluate every new religious idea? We should. We should. I Can we give to... Youth and, what? That's the difference between youth and age. <laughs> Can we give to anyone who asks us a reason for the faith or hope that is in us? Remember First Peter? We just studied about recently. Paul's opponents began by attacking Paul's authority. They probably suggested that he was not one of the original disciples and had never actually seen Jesus. Now, Paul admitted this. Um, there's a couple of places. Uh, I guess we probably have a chance of time to look at those really quickly. I pass on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins as written in the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised to life Three days later, as written in the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to all 12 apostles. Then he appeared to more than 500 of his followers at once, most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he appeared to James and afterwards to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared also to me, even though I am like someone whose birth was abnormal and so forth. So, Well, he says all that. What does it mean? <laughs> well, the... See, if, if the argument was, okay, Paul doesn't have authority because he didn't have any contact with Jesus Christ directly, that would be a powerful argument. You're really, you you huh? think um, authority and reason are two different things, aren't they? It's like yeah. authority comes and you just trust that person that he's telling you the truth, whereas reason, no, you no. kind of go through, you kind of well, have a reason like, for it. We need to be like the Bereans, sense. remember? What did the Bereans do? They listened, and then they went home and checked it out. So okay. hopefully reason and authority go together. Uh, that would be nice. They can, they can come <laughs> apart, though. Yeah. And they could, I mean, authority can come apart from reason and cause all kinds of trouble. Well, in 1 Corinthians 14 says, let the prophet speak one at uh, at a time and then let the others pass judgment. So there was kind of a communal coming together of deciding what was truth mm -hmm. uh, instead of just listening to one person and not thinking about, you know, just accepting it without any if, thinking. Okay, if your pastor stood up in front of the church and said, I have a message for you today that I got directly from heaven. Shouldn't they be doing that every day? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're inclined to have some questions about that kind of stuff, aren't we? Well, don't you think these false teachers came with authority too? They came sounding like they had authority. They, would, I, they probably came saying, we're authorized by the General Conference Brethren in Jerusalem. Okay, that would be a good thing of authority. But does it make sense? Does it, is it reasonable what they're saying? 
Well, I mean, that's that's the question. Where where do you how do you fit these two together? You know, someone can claim that somebody else teaches thus and so. You need to find out. Okay, is it really true? And then you need to find. Okay, do I should I believe that also? And that the problem is with most of us is we're too lazy to check it out for ourselves. Bring on the authority. Then I don't yeah, but, do anything. Examine all things. <laughs> hold fast to that which is good. Yeah. Consider Paul, though. Yeah. Here's a man for whom the authority from God was the Old Testament as he understood it. Later on, that same Old Testament was an authority that completely changed his mind mm -hmm. about God. Mm -hmm. So the same words can be seen and perceived and interpreted differently. Yeah. This is what happened to Paul, and this is what needs to happen to us. If we go in only by a legal system, and this was the problem with the Galatians, yeah. they were focused on the law. If we are accepting religion as being a set of r rules, mm -hmm. we're off the mark, because mm -hmm. a set of rules will never make our hearts any better. Only yeah. a message and a gospel means message. Mm -hmm. Only a message can change the way we think, mm -hmm. therefore change our hearts. Yeah. Ellen White says something in Testimonies to Ministers, page 119, thinking about how Paul was so certain about his gospel. She says, they, talking about Adventists, they must know that they do know what is truth. Can we actually do that? Sure. How do we know that Paul is telling us the truth? I think one reason why Paul was so sure he had the truth is that he looked at his message, it made sense, it had reason to it. He looked at their message, it had no reason to it. So I think that's why he would be really aggressive and say, mine is the way to go. Yeah. Well, he used to believe what they were teaching. Remember that. Yeah, that's that's the other thing. He, <laughs> he spent all his time in the desert, you know, getting all this straightened out. Now he's he's got these other guys coming over with this stuff all mixed up again. Look, One ahead. of the things, though, is uh, Jesus, uh, in John 7, 7, 16 and 17, it says, So Jesus answered and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know the teaching, whether it is of God mm -hmm. or whether I speak for myself. So unless we're willing to do God's will, we're not going to hear the message at all. Or if we did the will, that would prove it, what he said. Well, what about so, these words from John, the Apostle John, in Revelation 22, starting with verse 18? I, John, solemnly warn everyone who hears the prophetic words of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to his or her punishment the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes anything away from the prophetic words of this book, God will take away from them their share of the fruit of the tree of life and of the holy city which are described in this book. Was he sure about his gospel? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds, sounds like he was pretty certain, doesn't it? So maybe that's where we should be. Well, he didn't want anybody messing around with it. No. It was a big thing. <laughs> well, what's the story about an angel from heaven? Satan was an angel from heaven. Yeah. Yeah, but isn't that the ultimate messenger, an angel from heaven? Mm -hmm. And if an ultimate mission, the ultimate messenger comes down and contradicts him, mm -hmm. he's saying, don't even listen to that. Yeah. So. And why? Because of the story of Satan, Lucifer. I mean, he's the first one that circulated all that misinformation about God and caused all the trouble. Well, that and he came straight from heaven. Happen. It did. And, and the part that just blows me away, and I, and I, and it, I shake in my boots thinking about it, really. Here is someone standing in the very presence of God, and he convinced a third of the angels not to trust what God said. How did he do that? It just blows me. I mean, and what chance do we have standing up against something like that? Well, it could be that these peop these these other people that got swept away were a little gullible. 
say, th well, because then, this then. world hasn't happened yet, to go through everything that, that's happened, so they're... None of us are gullible, right? <laughs> well, what I'm saying is that during that yeah. time, this world has not happened yet, and with all yeah. the, the examples and everything. I agree. Well, look at Matthew 24, 44, just as we're talking about this. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear, not may appear, will appear. They will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. So we better be pretty sure about our gospel, it sounds like, right? We need to know the truth. That's how you detect a, the counterfeit. Is by it's obviously, the yeah. It's obviously very dangerous to accept mere claims. People have made every kind of incredible claim, religious claim that you can possibly imagine. So well, we have to figure out how to decide what's true and what isn't. It's not only claims, but fantastic manifestations, too. Yeah. 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 Well, we know the story of the two men from the, on the road to Emmaus. And what did Jesus say to them? Well, he took them through the Old Testament. Remember, there, was, there wasn't any New Testament yet. This was the day of the resurrection. I mean, and, and so he's taking them through the Old Testament. What's he showing them? Don't you wish you had a transcription of his? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's called Stephen's speech. Yeah, maybe Stephen's speech is the closest thing we have. Well, here's what Ellen White says very interestingly. Jesus did not first reveal himself in his true character to them and then open the scriptures to their minds. For he knew that they would be so overjoyed to see him again, rising from the dead, that their souls would be satisfied. They would not hunger for the sacred truths, which he wished to indelibly impress upon their minds, that they might impart them to others, who should in turn spread the precious knowledge and tell thousands of people should receive the light given that day, to the despairing disciples as a journey to Emmaus. So that's why one of the reasons why we think that this was the message that, that, that Stephen was following. He maintained his disguise till he had interpreted the scriptures and had led them to an intelligent faith in his life, his character, his mission to earth, and his death and resurrection. He wished the truth to take firm root in their minds, not because it was supported by his personal testimony, but because the typical law and the prophets of the Old Testament agreeing with the facts of his life and death, see he's checking out the evidence here, presented unquestionable evidence of that truth. When the object of his labors with the two disciples was gained, he revealed himself to them that their joy might be full and then vanished from their sight. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 214. Incredible experience. So if he would have revealed himself right off, they would have taken anything he said just by pure authority. Well, not only that, they would have probably turned around and run back to the disciples as fast as they could go, saying, guess what? We saw Jesus. Well, I don't know. I think, I think he would just, they would listen to him yeah. and wouldn't question anything. Anything you say, yeah. I'm going to... I'm going to believe it, but since he hid himself a little bit, they could listen to the reason of what mm -hmm. was being said. Well, so um, should we believe prophets that uh, what the prophet tells us? If he's an inspired think, prophet, well, think of First Kings thirteen, the story yeah. of the prophet who lied. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there wasn't very much reason there. Would uh, you think I, the Lord has told me? Yeah, but that the you're Lord to come told with me, me before. Does the Lord change his mind like that without telling me? That's what first? the prophet was telling, the young prophet. Yeah, it was well, the older prophet. The older, oh, says it's the older prophet. Well, then that's authority, right? Age exactly. gives authority. No, you, <laughs> you respect your elders. Yeah. 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 Newer, newer light from God has been given me, just as newer prophets maybe... Uh, claim to have updated God's word. Satan came claiming that he could ha he would have a better government. He could he was he was better capable of running things in heaven than God was. How could we He wants to be worshiped. He has made many false claims. 
against God. So who's, who's telling us the truth? Can God be trusted? Can Satan be trusted? Where do we go for the evidence? Notice what Satan said even while still in heaven. Satan, and this again is, uh, this is um, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 20. Satan refused to listen, and then he turned from the loyal and true angels, denouncing them as slaves. These angels, true to God, stood in amazement as they saw that Satan was successful in his efforts to excite rebellion. He promised them a new and better government than they then had. And who was their governor at that point? God himself. God himself in which all would be freedom. Great numbers signified their purpose to accept Satan as their leader and chief commander. As he saw his advances were met with success, he flattered himself that he should yet have all the angels on his side and that he would be equal with God himself and his voice of authority would be heard in commanding the entire host of heaven. I mean, I just, I read those kind of things and it just blows me away. Well, um, would we be better off if we had a live prophet among us today? That's the more recent prophet. But that we all be prophets. You know, that was Paul's yeah. uh, advice to the Corinthians that we should seek the higher gifts, especially that we might uh, prophesy. Are we, are we taking full advantage of all the evidence that's been given to us already? No. Wow. What percentage of the truths that we believe are solidly based on evidence from the Bible as spirit of prophecy? Have we checked that out for ourselves? Coming back to this core issue about the gospel, it depends on the truth. We must search and search and determine for ourselves, as the noble Bereans did, is it the truth? Do we understand it? Do we understand what the pastor says to us? Do we understand aspects? Ask questions. I mean, this is what Sabbath school classes are supposed to be for. Ask questions. Find out the truth. If the person who's answering the questions doesn't have the right answers, keep asking. God is challenging us to get ourselves ready because a terrible time of persecution and deception is coming. Our kind and loving Father, we recognize from the words that you have left us that scary times are ahead of us. May we have the convictions that Paul had as we read here in First Corinthians and Galatians, the first chapter, may we know that we do know the truth and be so convinced of it that nothing Satan can say or do will lead us astray. Is our prayer in Jesus' name?